The harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Why did he use that word? God goes to extreme measures to bring the loss to himself. The greatest gift you will ever give this world is your intimacy with God. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all three inside of me. I've got the power right now. I think what Jesus really wants is people to go. I want to be the answer to Jesus' prayer request. Welcome to the Fuel for the Harvest podcast. When this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, then shall the end come. Everyone and welcome to this latest episode of Fuel for the Harvest. This is Nathan and this is Charlie. We're your host for today and we're continuing the Red Flag series and today we're talking about the hope of the world. So I don't have a problem with the hope of the world. You don't have a problem with Jesus? So um, (laughs) now I just I'm about to caveat something. You're probably wondering what are you guys talking about? And why is this a red flag? Now, I want to tell you... Well, we've only said like 50 words in the whole we podcast. We so. <laughs> highly believe in the local church and involvement in the local church. If you don't know that, listen to our other episodes. Um, but there's this statement. We understand people's hearts, but we feel the statement is a bit off. And it's, the local church is the hope of the world. Right. And we do love the local church. 100% support the local church. I love my friends, but they're not the hope of the world. Yeah. Um, So we understand the sentiment behind the phrase, the local church is the hope of the world. What does that even mean? Well, let's get into that. But why do we have a problem with it? Because... Well, let's define what it means first. Okay. So what does it mean when somebody says the local church is the hope of the world or the hope on earth? It means essentially, well, um, apart from... God's people, there's no hope in this world. Mm. If God's people don't get it together, get into action and love those who need to be loved and share Jesus with those who don't know him, we're in big trouble. Right. That's what people mean when they say it. I agree with that meaning. That's true. How are they going to believe unless they hear? And how will they hear unless someone preaches to them? Romans 10. Highly important. But to say that the church is the hope of the world, I think, is misleading. Um, my only hope is in Christ and Christ alone. Yeah. He is the hope of my life and the hope of the world. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, I think that it is one of those things that we say all the time in Christianity, and we mean well when we say it. And I think it's even intended to inspire people like you are God's hands and feet in this world, which I would affirm that statement. Right. The church is his body, his hands, his feet, his beard, I don't know. And and in many ways, the the body of Christ has been paralyzed for a really long time. Uh, I I love this illustration that our president uses, the president of Ford uses. He talks about when he saw a quadriplegic man um, at a beach one time, and his family was getting out of the car to, to head towards the beach. And his daughter got so excited that she ran ahead and fell on the concrete. And he's sitting there here in this wheelchair, unable to move. And he wants somebody to help his daughter. And uh, th- the president of our ministry goes over and helps his daughter. And uh, oftentimes I think that that's exactly how Jesus feels about his body. Like, he's like, I want to go. I want to get to these people. I want to love these people. I want to care for these people, but my body won't respond to my commands. It's paralyzed. It's paralyzed. So absolutely, in that sense, I totally understand and affirm the sentiment behind the local church is the hope of the world because we do need to inspire the local church to say, get up, get to work, get moving. Absolutely. And to meet the needs of people physically and spiritually. Yep. To be the hands and feet of Jesus. Yeah. But who are we pointing to? Right. Us or him? Right. We need to point to Jesus, not to to ourselves, because he's the hope of the world. He's the light of the world. He's the light in this present darkness. And take a look around. I don't know about you, but the world's pretty dark. Right. And I don't know a single person nor group of people that can fix that darkness. I mean, unless you're talking about the person of Jesus. That's, yeah, I meant... Non-Jesus you know, people. I don't know any people right now in the flesh. Yeah. Um, they Wait, have, are you saying Jesus isn't in the flesh? Oh, no. 
sorry. I don't know any people who can fix all the world's problems. Yeah. Jesus can, the gospel can, and that's carried through his people. Yeah. Um, so I would be cautious with this phrase, as we've said probably about all of the red flags phrases. Yep. That, what do we mean when we say that? And let's be careful when we say it. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, ultimately, I think that it needs to be the goal of the local church to point, always point, 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 point to Jesus. Because uh, we're not perfect. What? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I think, too, it it creates a false sense of hope in people when they do get connected to the church. I agree. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I I completely agree that it sets people up for a false expectation of what they can expect from if, a group of people. Yeah, if the church gathering is the hope of the world, as soon as it fails you, your hope is gone. As soon as somebody disappoints you, you're in despair. Right. Game over. Man, that's a great observation. But I've discovered that when I have believers who've hurt me and wronged me and let me down and left me in difficult places, who's still there for me? Jesus. Always. He's there to lift me up, to encourage me, to help me forgive, to help me love those people who wronged me and move forward. And I've discovered that sometimes the worst pain is not from unbelievers or persecution from the outside. It's from believers who hurt you. Absolutely. And in addition to that, building off what you just said, ultimately, it's Jesus who does the transforming work of making us more like him. He's the good teacher. He's the, I don't know, the rabbi, if you want to call him that. He's the ultimate discipler, the the true discipler, the one who's really making a difference in people's lives. And we look at the local church and we say, hey, it's the responsibility of the local church to disciple people. And Like, I understand that this is a technicality in the language, but I feel like it's our responsibility in the local church not to just say it's our job, but to hook people up with Jesus and allow him to be the one discipling them. So a little bit of context on that. Um, We've talked about it before in the podcast, but just for a little more context. Just a reminder, that concept... um, we learned a lot from a pastor named Robert Gelinas who wrote a book called Discipled by Jesus, published by the Navigators Ministry. Uh, Great book. Check it out sometime. Um, No, we're not getting paid for this advertisement. We just like the book. Uh, This podcast comes at a cost. (laughs) (laughs) We're taking donations. Just kidding. But really, uh, forgeforward.org slash give. Anyway, um, so check out that book. It's awesome, but it boils down to this. Matthew chapter 28, The Great Commission... Jesus says to his disciples, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So where does this concept come from in that passage? Uh, he, Robert basically unfolds that we've misunderstood the meaning of this passage or the heart behind this passage, and how does he do that? Studying it, exegesis, cultural context, historical context, he digs into it, really fascinating stuff, he gets into Jewish discipleship and says, when you have a rabbi or a teacher, if he was dead, you all became the rabbis who would carry it forward. Right. So like the pattern was, I would go follow a rabbi and walk in his footsteps. And then when he died, I would become the rabbi rabbi. with other people walking in my footsteps. Exactly. But what would happen if that rabbi was still alive? You would invite people to go learn from him, not from just you. You'd say, listen, I've learned these things. You got to come check this guy out. Mm. And Jesus is still alive. It's discipleship in light of the resurrection. That's what Robert Gelinas proposes with this. And so he says, yeah, actually the Greek language matches that. It's discipleize all the nations. Like what we, we assume we know exactly what that means, that it's I disciple you. Like, but He's like the the word really is more like enroll people. enroll because disciple is a a learner a student so you're gonna go studentize the nations oh wait that makes more sense you're gonna make them students of Jesus to right. learn from him now that doesn't mean we're not teaching people we're to teach them to obey his commands to teach them to love Jesus in relationships so that they can them. be transformed by Jesus not yeah. by us so yes we have a role to teach and to equip 
and to lead people to Christ and lead them to follow Jesus. But ultimately, this this concept says it's bigger than me. I'm pointing to someone else who I follow too. Right. And honestly, that's matched my experience. Yeah. I Like, I think it's matched a lot of people's experiences where it's like, really, at the end of the day, it wasn't some fancy church program or some fancy speaker. It was Jesus, like a real life-giving relationship, a real true spending time alone with Jesus that totally transformed mm. my life. Like, Oftentimes when I'm speaking in front of people, I say there's two important things to know about me. Number two is that I'm married to my lovely wife, Taylor. Number one is that my life has been radically transformed by the living Jesus. And I wouldn't be standing in front of them if it wasn't for Jesus. And like, it's so completely, utterly true. It reminds me of uh, what the author of Hebrew says, that we should fix our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Um, Ultimately, we as followers of Jesus need to be pointing other people to fix their eyes on Jesus, and we ourselves need to be pointing our, our, ourselves <laughs> to yeah. keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And here's why. So I can't remember if I've shared this on the podcast. Forgive me if I have. You know when you talk a lot, you forget where you say certain things. <laughs> anyway, uh, I was driving a motorcycle in Southeast Asia um, for the very first time. Uh, I I would say that up until this moment in time, uh, about five years ago, I was a completely remedial dirt bike driver. (laughs) driver. I had all of 10 miles under my belt, maybe five miles under my belt, and uh, maybe, you know, a complete total of uh, like three or four hours of dirt bike riding. And uh, we were about to take a thousand mile dirt bike ride. And uh, we're scouting these unreached people groups and all this stuff. First day, get on the dirt bike. It's not so bad because it's all on paved roads. Second day, we start getting on the rough road. Over the course of the next week or so, I tipped that bike over or crashed it like 15 times. My knees have never been the same. (laughs) Like straight up, it destroyed my body. And uh, I learned over the course of learning how to drive these dirt bikes, especially on these like super rutted out jungle roads, that where you look is where you go. So if you're, cause that's when you start crashing, you always, you start looking at the road and you start freaking out because you see ruts in the road and you're like, Oh no, Oh no, Oh no, Oh no, Oh no. And you fix your eyes on the ruts in the road and guess where your bike goes right into the ruts of the road. But if you fix your eyes on the place that you want to drive, then that's where you go. Mm -hmm. And I think that concept rings true uh, in our relationship with Jesus. If you fix your eyes on this world, if you fix your eyes on your relationships, whatever, if you fix your eyes on anything but Jesus, that's where your life is headed. But if you fix your eyes on Jesus, you're going to head towards him. Other people will disappoint you no matter how great they are. They could be the best pastor you've ever met, the best dad you've ever had the best mentor, whoever it might be, they could be the greatest. Your life was transformed because of the truth they shared with you. Mm. They picked you up when nobody else was there for you. I guarantee you at some point, they'll still disappoint you. Right? They'll still fail you. Jesus will never fail you. He will be standing with you time and time again. I, I remember times when I've been so full of fear and anxious about what was coming, what I had to step into, not knowing what to say, not knowing what to do. Like, am I really the right guy to step into this? And in those moments, Jesus speaks to me mm. and says, hey, I've got this. Like, like, do you really, like, read your Bible again. Reminds me, he reminds me of verses like the gospel say the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything Jesus taught. Mm. And he'll bring, like one time he brought to mind this scripture in Romans where it says, the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Last mm. verse of Romans chapter 9. And the Lord prompted me, like, do you, do you really believe that? Yeah, okay, then you're not going to be put to shame, so don't worry. Mm. And I'm full of peace, and I can move forward with whatever God wants me to do. And so realize, yes, we believe in the church. Yes, you should be there. But we believe that ultimately Jesus is the one who is our hope. He's our hope and the hope of the whole world. He will carry you when no one else will. He, he'll he never let you down. He'll never let you down. He's perfect there's no other perfect people. The best church is going to disappoint you and they're doing a great job. Jesus will not. And I also would hesitate on taking his title. Ooh. 
I don't want to be the one to claim the glory um, no matter how great I am nor my group of people who gather in his name. I'm not your hope. He is. I'm not your light. He is. I'm going to point you to him in the name of Jesus, not to the name of my local church. Well, and that makes sense biblically because there is a distinct separation between Christ and the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. Yeah. Not Christ himself. Now I do realize in our American weddings and probably most weddings, the glory is usually on the bride the bride coming down the aisle and everybody looks at her they don't care about looking at the guy she's the beautiful one which i agree you should look at my wife compared to me although i'm not so Uh, sure that the imagery is all that different like i i think that christ lifts us up as the bride and he's like hey look at my bride yes but the glory goes to him at the end of the day when he comes back it's all crowns laid down at the feet of Jesus, king coming back with a double-edged sword out of his mouth, eyes of fire, robe dipped in blood, and then on the throne for all of eternity. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a king you can't forget. Amen. And uh, uh, all that to say, I don't want to take that king's place, title, or even make it sound like it's a possibility. Yep. He's our hope. Um we thought this is a great Merry Christmas episode. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jesus, the hope of the world, the one coming, the Messiah that we've been waiting for to save us from our sins. He's coming for us. And um, we're so thankful for that. I wanted to just um, wrap up with reading this passage out of John chapter one about Jesus and the hope that he brings. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is what it says. John chapter one shares these words. In him, talking about Jesus, was life, and life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Who can be overcome? Pretty much everybody except Jesus. Mm. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. Man, that the whole world would believe in the light, believe in Jesus. He was pointing not to himself, but to the light, to the one who is the hope of the world. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light gives light to everyone who was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own people, and they did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Mm. All about Jesus, who's come to be Emmanuel, God with us and dwelling among us, to save us from our sin, from our darkness and despair, to push back the darkness that it might flee, and darkness flees when you turn on the light. And Jesus is the light of the world and the hope of the world. Mm. Let's be sure we don't take his place. Let's rejoice and celebrate Jesus, the light and hope of the world, pointing our lives, fixing our eyes on him and pointing others to him too. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, uh, just so you guys know, um, this is going to be our last episode for the 2021 year. Um, So we'll see you guys next year. Uh, This is a dumb joke, I know. But... uh, Uh, Yeah, so no episode next week, but uh, enjoy your Christmas holiday. Enjoy your time with your family and friends. Um, Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. (laughs) (laughs) Happy birthday, dear Jesus. I don't know. I just came up with that song. You know, Mm. I'm an artist. Apparently. Yeah. Um, Don't forget to unsubscribe and resubscribe. We really appreciate it. Uh, Like and share if you enjoyed this podcast. And uh, remember, Jesus is the light and the hope of the world. Well, thank you guys for joining. Merry Christmas. God bless you and see you in 2022.